All right, so we were talking about the subatomic particles, electrons, protons, and neutrons, and the static charges that each one of them have. And we were talking about the dynamics of the atom itself, as far as how the electrons orbiting around cause that centrifugal force to be pushing that electron out of its orbit. We decided that we needed some sort of handle on the bucket in order to keep that electron in its orbit. Well, folks, these static charges are all governed by a law. Um, it's actually called the law of electrostatics. Now, this is a law of physics, and um, a lot of times we see the same thing hold up in people and personalities and stuff. And if you think about it, you get two people together that like to tell other people what to do, and you put them in a room, well, they're not going to last very long in there. They're, they're going to repel away from each other. But if you get somebody that likes to tell someone what to do and put them in a room with somebody that likes to be told what to do, well, they don't suck up like big time. So it holds true that opposites attract and likes repel. And folks, that is the law of electrostatics. It simply states that two like charges attract, uh, two like charges repel and two unlike charges attract. So let's write that down. So yeah, the law of electrostatics states that unlike charges attract and like charges repel. I've got a couple little diagrams here. If I have two positive charges, they're going to repel away from each other. Two negative charges repel from each other. However, a positive and a negative charge attract to each other. Well, if we go back to thinking about it, the nucleus has the proton in it, which is positively charged. Now that electron, which is negatively charged, is attracted to that positive charge of that proton. Well, based on that, if we have that centrifugal force that's wanting to fling it out, and we have this force of positive and negative attraction, that's actually our hand on the handle of the bucket. So when we're looking at this, we have to realize <clears throat> that these two forces have to be perfectly razor edge balanced because a little too much centrifugal force, that electron goes flying, too much attractive force from the static charge brings that electron into the nucleus. So these two forces have to be identical in order to maintain that electron in that orbit. And folks, you've got to realize everything in our world is based on this balance of keeping these atoms together. Everything, matter is made up of uh, molecules and elements. Molecules and elements are made up of atoms and atoms are made up of electrons, protons, and neutrons and these two forces that are balanced together. So. <clears throat> We got the law of electrostatics, we want to make sure that we know that, and we want to make sure that we know the two atomic forces. Okay, so the atom, nucleus has a proton and neutron, the electron orbiting around, the electron in orbit creates a centri centrifugal force, wants to force the electron out. We have the static charges of the electron and the proton cause an attraction between each other. Uh, positives and negatives, the positive proton in the nucleus and the negative electron in orbit. These two, <clears throat> based on their static attraction, keep the atom together, okay? So there's basically the, the concept that we need to have of the atom. Now, we have to understand that, go ahead, copy this. Okay, so one of the next things we need to understand is that you know, atoms can have different numbers of electrons and, and protons and that sort of thing. And what we want to know is, first of all, what is considered a balanced atom. Now, even though an electron and a proton are different in physical size, the amount of electrostatic charge that they have is equal. So if I have the same number of electrons as I have protons, I have the same amount of negative charge as I have positive charge. These two charges cancel out to leave the overall atom in what they call a neutral state or a balanced state. This is what we consider a balanced atom. It's simply an atom that has no overall charge. It isn't negative and it isn't positive because the two cancel each other out. Well, that's not really good for what we want to do because, you know, bottom line, I'll tell you what electricity is, is about. We got, we got these balanced, electro balanced atoms, and we're coming along and we're going to slap some of them electrons out of their orbit. So electrons are out of their orbit. What are they naturally going to want to do? Well, they're naturally going to want to come back to where they came from. Um, if Think about this. If I have a rubber band and I take a rubber band and I stretch that rubber band, what's going to happen when I let that rubber band go? Well, it's going to assume the same shape that it had before I stretched it out. It wants to assume its original form. Same thing for atoms. If I come up and slap an atom, knock the electron right out of an atom, well, that electron still wants to make it back. Well, folks, that's what we're going to do. We're going to slap these atoms, knock their electrons out of them. They're naturally going to want to come back to where they came from, and we're actually going to control them by making it go through some lights or go through motors or go through our cell phone charger. We're going to control these electrons moving through here in order to be able to provide you know, the work we need to, to do. So that basically is the whole thing. So we start off with a balanced electron, and then we slap these electrons, or a balanced atom, and then we slap these electrons out of their orbits. Well, they actually have a name for this knocking electrons loose. It's called ionization.
Ionization. Ionization is the process of gaining or losing electrons. That's, that's us slapping electrons out of orbit, okay? Now, there's only seven ways known to man that this happens. There's only seven things, and folks, that's really important that you understand what these are. Now, before I list them for you, I'm gonna tell you why they're important. Um, they are physical actions that occur. Heat, pressure, just different things that occur that we need to measure, and the only way that we can get an electronic signal out of these physical changes is through this process of ionization. So every sensor that we're gonna come across in the field, whether it's sensing temperature, pressure, flow rates, levels, no matter what the sensor is actually sensing, it is taking a physical change and converting it into an electrical change. Well, that's what we do, and that's what we use ionization for. So if you know the factors that cause ionization, every sensing element that you come across out there in the field is gonna be based on one of these, and just knowing the theory of operation of how it works helps you better determine if it's working and if it's working properly, okay? So we need to know these factors that cause ionization. Get it? All right, so the factors that cause ionization, things that slap electrons right out their orbit. Well, you think about it, just pow, slap you, well, that's friction, okay? So friction, think about walking across the carpet in the wintertime, touching the doorknobs, pow, or sliding out of the seat of your truck and then going to shut the door, it gets you. So friction is one of them. Another way to do it, not only is a slap across the face friction, but it's, excuse me, it's also creating pressure. Every electronic scale out there uses a pressure sensor. So pressure. Now think about this. How about all those solar panels that people mount on top of their roofs and, and um, big old solar arrays out there to generate electricity? Well, what are they actually consuming? Light. Now, we also have coming from the sun heat, but that isn't really what is considered solar. But if I heat something up, I can start boiling off electrons too. So heat is also one of those. And probably the most common one um, where the majority of our electricity is created, whether it comes from uh, a nuclear plant or a coal-fired plant or a natural gas electrical uh, facility, all of them basically turn generators. Now, generators are connected to turbines, and we use pressurized steam to actually turn the turbine to turn the generator to create the electricity. And the difference from these types of plants is actually the fuel that they use to create the heat to generate the steam to turn the turbine to create the electricity. But what is happening in that generator? Well, generators like alternator in your car, their function is all based on magnetism. Magnetism. Only two more, okay? So the next most common one, and that's the one that we're gonna use in DC, and we see in DC the most, and it's the one that batteries actually function on, and that is a chemical reaction. Batteries have electrolyte in it, chemicals, they react to produce this electrical energy. And then last but not least, Nuclear radiation, that was probably the least common. Now understand this, there is a difference between a nuclear radiation and a nuclear reaction. Keep in mind, it is chemical reaction, nuclear radiation. Gamma particles being bombarded onto a sensor. Uh, there's application for it, we'll look at it, but nuclear radiation is the seventh. So that's all seven factors. These are the only things that are known to man that will actually cause this ionization process, okay? Now, I didn't come up with this, a student actually came up with it and shared it with us, but look. NFL champ. It's an easy way to remember. This is how I taught the rest of the classes. Nuclear radiation, friction, light, chemical reaction, heat, well, A, magnetism, and pressure. Okay, NFL champ, at least give you the first letter of each one of them. We need to know these. Every sensor that we're going to look at is going to be based on one of these factors that cause ionization. Okay, so get this copy. All right, so I told y'all, you know, bottom line is, is we're going to slap electrons loose from the atoms. Those electrons are naturally going to want to come back to where they came from, and we're simply going to make them go through some things and do some work for us in their natural migration back to where they came from. So we understand, we've all seen uh, an extension cord, okay? There are, that is how we have the means of allowing electrons to go in particular places. In other words, if I want it to go to that motor over there, well, I'm going to take the wire, like an extension cord, and I'm going to run the wire over there to that motor. Well, that path allows us to, to get electrons flowing through the device that we're trying to power. Well, understand, 
that if I look at an extension cord, if I have it plugged into the receptacle and I grab the outside of that extension cord, the rubber part, I'm not going to get shot because there's some materials that electrons don't float through and like the little metal wire, the conductors, whoop, there's the word, the conductors inside, the wire inside is what the electrons actually flow through because they can flow through that. There's some materials where electrons cannot flow through and that brings us to this next subject of conductors and insulators, okay? So a conductor is a material that will allow electron flow and an insulator is a material that won't. Let's write that down. Okay? And look, I left a little space up there because I'm going to put something else up there. So conductors allow electron flow and insulators do not allow electron flow. Well, how is it that some materials do and some materials don't? Well, another basic law of nature is that uh, there's strength in numbers. So I told y'all that not every type of material has the same number of electrons and protons. Um, for example, hydrogen only has one electron, one proton, and one neutron. Um, but then you have something like gold, which may have 60 or 70 electrons, protons, and neutrons. And what you need to understand is if that nucleus has electrons around it, all those electrons are not going to be in the same orbit. Just like Venus, Mars, Mercury, Earth, all these planets are not in the same orbit, they're in different orbits. So if this is my nucleus, I may have two electrons in that first orbit, and then four electrons in the next orbit, and we have these orbits until we have just as many as we can... can I know it doesn't sound all that smart, but... Anyway, so the different orbits we're looking at, but the only orbit that we're really considered in is the very outer orbit. The very outer orbit has the electrons that we're going to be dealing with. Now, going back to that strength in numbers thing, if my outer orbit has almost a full shell, all those combined forces pulling in, it's hard to knock one of those electrons out of its orbit. But if that last orbit only has one or just a few electrons in it, it doesn't have that combined energy of all those electrons, and it's actually pretty easy to separate that electron out of its orbit. And so electrons that are easily separated actually will flow, but those that have almost to a full shell on that outer shell have that strength in numbers, and they're difficult. These we call insulators because they're more difficult to cause to, to float. But I'm going to tell you, if you push hard enough on anything, you can get flow through it. So just keep that in mind. There's no, no such thing as a perfect insulator. So that being said, I want you all to know that the outermost shell of electrons is called the valence shell, the valence shell. And the electrons in the valence shell are called valence electrons. The valence shell is the outermost shell of electrons in the atom, and then valence electrons are those electrons in that valence shell. Now remember, that outer shell is the only place we're going to be slapping electrons from and that sort of thing. So the number of those electrons is what determines whether something conducts or whether something insulates. So to be considered a conductor, and be considered an insulator, five or more. So one to three valence electrons, remember, just a few of them are easily slapped out, and then insulators will have five or more. Now this always generates a question, well I got one to three, I got five or more, how about four valence electrons? Well four valence electrons falls into its own category called semiconductors. Excuse me, they will either act as a conductor or an insulator depending on certain conditions, okay? So semiconductors we're not going to talk about, we got a couple of terms of that coming up, uh, but conductors one to three, insulators five or more, okay? Get this copy. I mean, there's four conductors that are primarily used in electrical electronic technology. Um, from the very best conductor to the worst conductor is how I'm going to them. So the best conductor is gold. So when you see those um, gold terminations for audio and that sort of thing, believe it or not, they are better. I know they're all pretty and cool looking and stuff too, but they do provide a better noise to signal ratio by having a, a better conductor. So gold is the best in silver, then copper. And then aluminum. 
All right, so um, we think about these. First thing I want to tell you is all four of these conductors only have one valence electron. Well, if they all only have one valence electron, why is one better than the other? Well, think about this. What is the heaviest material up here? Well, yeah, gold. And the next heaviest? Silver. And then copper, and then aluminum is the lightest. So if you think about that, what actually causes their weight is their mass, and their mass is based on how many electrons and protons are in each individual atom. So aluminum being the lightest, it's going to have the fewest electrons. So if the nucleus is here, you know, I may have some orbits of electrons, but aluminum will be closest to the nucleus because I have the fewest number of electrons and protons in my actual atom. And then copper being next, <clears throat> that one valence electron will be a little bit further, therefore reducing the amount of interaction between the positive and negative charges. So even easier to separate. And again, yeah, the next one, silver, it's one valence electron may be out there, and then gold, it's one valence electron way out there. So gold being the furthest away and having the less attractive force is more easily separated from that atom than this one valence electron in aluminum because it's closer to. So we have these different degrees of conductivity. Which ones are better? Well, the reason is, is because of the mass and where that one valence electron is in relation to that nucleus of the atom itself. Okay, so conductors and insulators. Conductors do allow electron flow. Insulators don't. The difference between them is the number of valence electrons. That's the electrons in the outermost shell. The four basic or the four commercially used uh, conductors, gold, silver, copper, and aluminum. And the reason one is better than the other is because of the spacing or the distance of that one valence electron from the nucleus itself. Okay, so that's conductors and insulators. We're going to put a hold on it, and we'll come back here in a second, and we'll do uh, the, the big three. Now, the big three, we're going to talk about every day from here on out, but the big three, if you something to look forward to, is voltage 